Hi there, and welcome to the Love or Leave the Law podcast with your hosts, Adam Olette and Casey Berman. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Love or Leave the Law podcast. Casey and I are so excited today for one reason only is that we've got an amazing guest and she's got some amazing background and stories and also an amazing book yeah. that I have read and absolutely loved. Her yeah. name is Liz Brown. I'm going to read a little bit of uh, her background and then we're going to ask her some questions. We're going to put her on the hot seat, which she'll enjoy because she used to litigate. So uh, welcome, Liz, Liz, welcome. Yes. Thank you. Glad to be here. Awesome. Well, Liz is an expert on alternative career options for lawyers. She was a former big law partner. She's the author of the book, as I held up, Life After Law, Finding Work You Love with the JD You Have. Speaking from experience and extensive research, Liz talks compellingly about why so many lawyers struggle with their career changes, their unique challenges and options, and, creative, and, and she's got creative, effective strategies for identifying these next steps. Her preferred skills theory helps lawyers reconsider their career options by reframing their talents using the 30 X lawyers profiled in her life after law. And one of the things we're going to talk about today, everybody, is the path that some of these people that she's worked with and knows, the path that they had out of the law and understanding that it is a possibility and a capability for you to leave the law if you want. Yeah. So she's a business professor, a professor of business law at Bentley University, in addition to being a former law partner. She's the former executive director in the Boston of Se Golden Seeds, the largest source of angel funding for women entrepreneurs, which we want to talk a little bit about today because I've really read a little cool. bit about that and it seems very interesting to me. She graduated from Harvard College and Harvard Law School and has practiced in San Francisco, London, and Boston, advising senior executives at Fortune 500 companies on legal strategies and managing multi-million dollar cases from inception to successful resolution. She can be found at lizbrownjd.com, and we'll flash it up on the screen for you so you guys can check out her website. So thank you, Liz, for being here with us. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. When I, hey everyone, Casey here, and I just want to add one more to your thing to your resume, Liz, you may not know, but a big inspiration to me and leave law behind. Uh, as everyone knows, I'm at leavelawbehind.com, helping people leave the law and find alternative careers. And, and when I read your book, I realized this little blog I was creating was not isolated in its own world, in my own head, that there were other people who, who had, you know, Professor Dershowitz uh, as, as, a, as a reviewer and real, real life stuff. And I think when you, when you wrote your book and really went out there with that courageous step to do so, I think for people like me, it said, okay, not only is this possible, which I knew it was because I had done it, but that it's becoming more mainstream. There's other people writing about it. And just the work that you've done was a huge inspiration to me. So I am just, I'm, I'm so happy you're on, on the, the podcast with us. So thank you for joining us. And likewise, your work inspires me. And I love being able to recommend your work and your consulting services and your course to other people. It is great because honestly, the more... The more people we help, the fewer unhappy lawyers in the world, and that's kind of my mission in life. Fewer yeah. unhappy lawyers. Well, and, and it, which is ours, which is mine, which is Adam's, and, and it aligns with that. There's so much potential they have, and if they're just doing the thing that aligns with them. Um, so I want to kick off by saying kind of an obvious question, but this is possible, yeah, to leave the law? Oh, it's so possible, possible, right? Oh yeah, absolutely possible and a really good idea. And my approach to leaving law is very pragmatic. It's very practical. I appreciate sort of, you know, aspirational thinking, but I'm really all about what is going to work. And so yeah. my approach in writing this book, my approach in working with clients is let's get this done. How can we realistically get this done? And thousands of people get it done you know, every year, that's probably a conservative estimate. It happens yeah. all the time, but lawyers don't talk about it among themselves, and that's why we think it's not possible. It's hugely possible. So we're going to get in those steps. I've got steps. I, I can't wait to hear your steps, which align and, and with mine and, and what Adam's talked about and also new ideas that you have. What gets in the way? Why do we even need to say and, and reconfirm that this is possible? Because lawyers have a culture of insulation when you, and, and business school graduates don't. Like when you go and talk to people with MBAs, they understand that they have these portable skills that they can yeah. take anywhere and do anything with because they're exposed to a range of different career paths. Yeah. 
the gate. Lawyers, not so much. Sort right. of, you can go to law school, you are, get this you know, big law firm salary, the sort of private practice option dangled in front of you as a very effective way to pay off the massive loans you probably now have. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's narrow thinking, I think, from the get-go. That's, that's one big reason. Yeah. I would say another big reason is, and a big reason for me, the reason that I couldn't really think creatively about leaving the law for myself for a long time was I had, nobody had ever asked me what I liked doing. <laughs> right. I, I, right. No one ever asked me what I enjoyed. I was tested on what I was good at, and I was told to do what I was good at, but I was good at a lot of things that kind of made me miserable in the end. You and and you went to law school for you know family reasons, cultural reasons, because you watched L.A. Log or Perry Mason growing up, or because you just should. You Alan were, Alan Alan exactly. We all have our TV show. That's right. Um, you know, you you were a good speaker. You 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 talked with your hands. You were persuasive at the dinner table, whatever it was, and said, "Well, just go to law school because you speak well." Little yeah, do it was. I didn't know anybody who was a lawyer, but I was always good at arguing. Still yeah. good at. Um, and so the people around me said, you know, like so many of us here, well, if you don't know what to do, go to law school because you can do anything with a law degree. And it wasn't until years later that I realized you can also do anything without a law degree except practicing law. Right. So true. Right. I tell people, you really should be very, very sure that you want to practice law and know exactly what kind of law you want to practice, having seen it in real life as opposed to on TV before you make that commitment to law school. I think that's a really important uh, comment because one of the things that happened with me is I just assumed that I would like being a lawyer and I was very good at arguing and I've talked a little bit about that in my book. But when I read this quote in your book, I, I said, wow, you know, this is put perfectly. You said law school was a socially acceptable way to defer a more detailed career decision that I lacked the self knowledge to make. And that's exactly yeah. what we're talking about here. We don't, we don't look at what we like to do or what we love to do before we even go or decide to go to law school. A lot of us have our minds made up well before that. And I think there's so many lawyers that got into the profession just because they didn't know what else to do. And for yeah. me, I look back on that and I look at people that have told me that and I say, that is one of the worst things to do and decisions to make if you don't know what to do don't do anything at that point until you can figure it out a little bit more, but it's a long three years. And you also said, believing that I would enjoy being a lawyer, helped me make it through the misery of law school. I totally align with that. And right before we started recording this, I was telling Liz that her and I couldn't be more different. I mean, I didn't go into big law. I went to a mediocre law school. I didn't go to Harvard. Um, I had decent grades, but, and I went into to small law and, and worked for a solo practitioner for a while and became his partner. And so we couldn't be uh, any more different, but we, we say the same stuff about what's wrong with the profession, the challenges of, of the profession. And, and I think if we can reach some people that are, are in the process of deciding to go to law school and they hear some of this stuff, which is, I've got yeah. some articles I'm starting to write for that. I think we can help people figure out that maybe law school isn't the best way and the best path to be on. And I, I believe myself that I did it for a reason. I mean, I know Liz, when you look at what you're doing now and you're teaching and, and you're helping and, and you're clearly a, you're a published author, we all, the three of us, we all went to law school for a reason. And everybody that I talked to that is a lawyer, they went for a good reason, even though it doesn't look like it at the time. Yeah. We are all part of that process of go figure it out, be be a lawyer for a while, and then if we're meant to leave, if we're meant to stay, whatever that is, it does give us a background, and Casey talks about it extensively, and Liz, in your book, you talk about it as well, and that is, there's so many transferable skills yeah. that we have as lawyers, but we don't, we don't take that uh, with a grain of salt. We don't understand that those skills are unlike skills that are out there in, the, in any kind of industry. And when I look at other types of professions, and I, we've talked a little bit about this on this podcast, but I want to get your take on it, Liz. When you look at someone that's an MD or a CPA, uh, those skills aren't all that transferable like a lawyer has. And I'm, I've got some listed, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But tell me what your thoughts are about these skills that are so transferable yeah. to any kind of career that someone's looking to go into when they decide to leave the law. 
So I think that people who gravitate toward law school are generally good at one of a number of things and different people, you know, are better at or like doing some of these more than others. But generally speaking, people who are interested in law school may like advocating and they may like problem solving and they may like managing, they may yeah. like writing, they may like editing, helping people, counseling people, yeah. public speaking. You're, you know, yeah. Thinking. Eminently, like all of these skills are really good, make somebody a, a good lawyer, but they can also make somebody a really good many other things. That's right. And so, whether you're talking about trying to make a decision as to whether or not to go to law school, or whether you're talking to somebody who's been five years, 10 years, 30 years out of law school, you probably still have whatever skills made you think law school was a good fit for you. There's just a way to repurpose. Them. You know, you know, you the first obstacle you mentioned was just, well, what else could I do? I just have legal skills and these portable skills or transferable skills. There are just so many. I mean, if you think about being the adult in the room or upselling clients or or taking all these disparate pieces of information and weaving them into a story and a narrative for a judge or a partner. I mean, that's needed in consulting. It's needed in PR. It's needed in content marketing. I, we could go on and on. And I think another issue that lawyers have. So the good news is there is so much, so many great skills that we have as attorneys that can be transferable elsewhere. I think the, the bad news is we're so myopic. Um, we only hang out with other attorneys. Uh, we don't really know other, we know what a CEO is at a business, but we don't really know much else out there. What, you know, Liz, whether it's, it's someone that, that you profiled in the book or, or that you know about, is there an example of someone where they kind of got over this block and were able to see their skills as really portable, is transferable? How'd they do that? Yeah, all the time. I mean, in my, in my book, In Life After Law, I give examples of how you can repurpose each one of those skills. Yeah. But I was working with somebody last week who is a lawyer in Washington, D.C., in the Washington, D.C. area, um, who had been focusing on how could he do something else with the substantive knowledge he's developed over the course of his career. But when we talked about what he, what experiences he really enjoyed, he talked about work he had done with his kids, you know, Boy Scout troop. And we talked about work he had done with his church group. And we talked about all these experiences that he had where it turned out that he was really good at mentoring and motivating other people. Yeah. And at some point during our conversations, I said to him, you know, that would make you a really good manager. Mm. And it's like the light bulb went on, you know, you guys have talked about light bulb moments. Yeah. And he was real, he really did enjoy the managing parts of his cases. But yeah. it's not only, it's not only myopia, you know, we have to focus on uh, not being able to see the transferability of what we That's do. That's right. But also, lawyers use law-specific terms to describe what they do, and that sometimes keeps us from thinking about their portability. Like, for me as a litigator, I did depositions all the time. I thought of them as depositions. My resume was covered with this deposition, that deposition. Right. But I didn't think of them as my ability to understand other people and to ask questions and to work with decision makers and to do all these yeah. other things. And those skills, because we hide them in legalese, yeah, yeah. You know, that's the big challenge with rewriting resumes too for lawyers. You were a psychologist, you were a cat herder, you were a, the adult in the room, you know, all within the word deposition, there were all these right. skills. You know, you talk about the, the manager, uh, there's a woman who I helped recently leave the law and she was contract attorney, just not, just kind of in limbo. And what we found in going through what I call her unique genius, her skills was that she was a process uh, savant, a process geek. She loves steps. This comes first. I don't think that way, but she thought very, mm. so now she's doing uh, project management in a tech yeah. company where yeah. you need, you know, and so the light bulb went off for her where she said, wait a minute, you mean I can be that person, air traffic control that makes sure all the steps are done? I said, yeah. And there's a job out there that calls for that. Yeah. It's called a project manager. And, and she's now working there. So when I, I know exactly what you're talking about when that light bulb goes off and they realize that their skills can fit. And this guy, he was at a firm or what was just the background of him so people can understand where he's coming from? He was in, he worked for the government for a while and then he transferred to a firm. Got it. And 
he just was looking at the wrong things. Yeah, exactly. That happens Great. to a lot of people. It happens to a lot of people. And that's why it sometimes really helps to talk to others who are outside the legal profession, people who are coaches or people who are, you know, if you know the right questions to ask, Yeah. talking to other people can really help open up a huge amount of information and these incredible new possibilities where there are, Job openings in so many different fields capitalize on these. Right. Stuff. So, Lid, let me ask you a question there because one of the major obstacles I see in attorneys to go to our list here is they don't want to talk to other people. They don't want to admit it. Right. They don't want to go to another attorney or a friend or have a cup of coffee. They don't want to say I'm unhappy. They don't want to say, hey, what else is out there? Um, I have an, uh, another client that I help. Uh, she, we talked through things and she finally went to coffee with a friend and said, you know, I'm unhappy as a lawyer. I want to do something else. The friend said, who wasn't an attorney, you know, I'm a legal recruiter for this big Fortune 500 company. I don't want to do it anymore. Lo and behold, <laughs> She interviewed and 30 days later, she's taking her friend's job who moved to someone else and she's happy and it's great. How do you, how do they, why are attorneys so tight lip when it comes to saying they're unhappy and how, how can they get over that? I think there's a cultural belief in law firms and many law firms and the law, in every law firm I've been at and every law firm, you know, where I've talked to people in that if you admit you're unhappy, it's like an admission of failure. Yeah. Law, I think, is unique in that profession because other fields don't have the same kind of stigma about leaving. Right. Many, in many lawyers' views, if you leave, it's because you can't cut it. Yeah. Or there's something wrong with you, not, yeah. you know, you're wondering what else is out there. I mean, yeah. most people, when they leave, they find that the minute they announce that they're leaving, people come into their office, close the door behind them. <laughs> Yeah. Go on. Who's really happy? Right. I've, I've networked a lot with lawyers over the years. Clearly, lawyers were some of my best uh, influencers and people that referred me business. And when you're talking with a group, let's say three, four, five, or more lawyers, and you're talking to them about whether they like the profession, they sugarcoat stuff. But when you get them one on one, they will bear their soul to you every time. And there, there isn't that many lawyers that I've met over the years, and I've networked with thousands of them that really said to me, yes, I love the law. And it's interesting that a lot of those lawyers were uh, estate planners. I'm not sure why. I'm not, I don't know what it is about estate planning. Maybe it's because we don't have to deal with a lot of lawyers as estate planners. We're just dealing with clients. But it's funny how we, we want to hide from that and we don't want anybody to know it. But if someone asks us one-on-one, -on -one, we will admit to it. It's interesting. Yeah. I, I, yeah. And I, I have met a lot of happy lawyers. You know, I huh. used to work with people who genuinely loved what they did. And I still have some of my best friends are happy lawyers. And there's nothing, there's no shame in that. Oh, no, not at all. Right. And that's, that's great. I mean, we need people to do this work. We yes. especially need happy lawyers and legal services and other, you know, underserved areas of the law. But we, it, there should similarly be no shame in saying, you know, right. I'm just as smart as anybody else here. I'm just as good a writer. I'm just as good a manager. I'm just as good a problem solver. But this particular situation is good for me that's and i'm going to find somewhere else to handle that's it well and in you your know, book you talk about the core legal skills writing advocacy counseling management research and you you go into in depth the writers the entrepreneurs the artisans the analysts there is so much out there even in the law that most people don't realize but there's so much that people can see and, and find outside of what this narrow focus is, and you talk about it, you know, there's a, there's a narrow viewpoint where we have this identity that's so connected to being in the law, and Casey talks about this a lot too in his work, where we just, we can't admit to ourselves that we went to law school, we, we actually learned what to do as a lawyer, we get to this point where we, we're comfortable with what we know, and we look at it and we say, man, there's got to be something else out there for us, but it's getting to that point, I think, where we had admit to ourselves like I did, you know, I, I found lots of things about the law to love and I could still be doing it. And I've talked to Casey at length about this. I could work two, three hours a day and make a really nice income because I had delegated everything I was doing for the most part and other than bringing in clients and running the business. And I, but I just got bored with that too. It's like, yeah. there's something out there, but I had to get to the point where I made that decision. I just don't want to do this anymore. And that yeah. to me is, is the biggest problem for a lot of the people I talk to where they just can't admit to themselves that maybe it's time to move on. And it's, it's similar in relationships or partnerships and a lot of things in life, but it's coming to that realization that 
you know what, I, I need to find this pathway out. And, uh, and that's why I'm so happy to be here with both of you, because you both offer people structure on how to leave, which hasn't been before. I mean, I, yeah. when I first started looking at leaving, I was five years in, into the 20 years of I've been practicing, and, and there was no one, no one that, yeah. that's doing the work you're doing. So I applaud and thank you both for everything you're doing. That's really nice of you to say. I mean, I think that one of the things that's really important to realize is that you don't have to get to that brink where you feel like, I absolutely have to leave this minute in order to start figuring out your escape. Right. And in fact, the best time to start taking steps, and you can take steps for figuring out what you want to do next while you're still practicing life. Right, that's, that's the best, best way. Time. Right? You may think, I've got no time, I'm already working 2,000, billing 2,000 hours a year. Okay. But you have half an hour a week, maybe 10 minutes a day while you're standing in line at Starbucks. Right. Think about these questions. If you know, we can give you the right questions to be thinking about, then you can be laying the groundwork and have as much flexibility and freedom as to when to leave and how to leave as possible. I did it kind of the wrong way. I waited till I was on the brink of exhaustion with no plan at all. I really don't recommend that. You know, some I've been there, done that, Liz. I, yeah. I know where you're coming from. That's why when I read that in your book, I, I had read uh, Tama Keeb's book too, This Time I Danced, because she was a, a lawyer as well. And I read that book a while back. And, you know, she's saying exactly the same things we're talking about. It, and, she, and you quote her in there, if you're this successful doing work you don't love, what could you do with work you actually love? Therein lies a, a distinction that really needs to be made. I mean, it's... And, you know, I think what's great about your point there about doing it in conjunction and parallel with the current job is that there's this feeling I see with lawyers who want to leave that obviously they're very risk averse. They're risk averse people themselves. They are taught, we are taught in law school to avoid and mitigate risk. That's the whole point, right? That's how we counsel. Um, so professionally, we focus on it. And then there's this idea where, well, you know, there's no net. I'm not going to leave. It's all or nothing. It's very black and white. And leaving the law is much more nuanced than that. You don't. I talk about doing it properly. There's a right way. There's a pragmatic way to do it. What are some thoughts there around whether it's thinking about it for a half hour online at Starbucks or just meeting people incrementally for informational interviews, but what are some other tips where lawyers can kind of get this parallel path, feel comfortable with it and kind of mitigate or reduce that all or nothing type of dynamic that I think prevents them from even getting started? So my approach to leaving the law involves a couple steps, and these steps can all be done while you're still working at your, you know, your right. day job. And the first step that I recommend is pretty introspective, and it's really this: it's really figuring out what is your, what are your preferred skills, Casey, right. what you call your unique genius. Mm -hmm. What is it that you feel great about being good at? You know, what is that's you right where you've gotten a sense of flow. And it may be something you've done in law, it may be something you've done outside of law, um, on the weekends, volunteer, you know, and before you went to law school, what are the kinds of experiences that made you feel, time has stopped, I just have this sense of flow. And compiling a list of what those experiences have been for you will help, is, is basically the first part of yeah. Process I recommend in my book and when I'm working with clients. Totally agree. So yeah. that's the first thing. And then once you have a sense of where you want to add value in the world, what it is, what skills you have that you are great at and you really like being good at, yeah. then the next stage is figuring out where to apply those skills. Yes. And that's where the interviewing, the networking, the brainstorming, you know, comes in. Right. That can be done in bits and pieces mm -hmm. while, while you are building toward the right way to leave your job. Now, there's no doubt, you know, people might give you the stink eye when you walk out uh, for an informational interview, a coffee in the office. Um, if you've yes. got hit, you know, there's, there's, it's kind of a second job or a 1.5 job. I mean, it is extra work to do. It is, but you can set that pace. Yeah. I mean, you know, if, unless something has gone really wrong and you are being shown in the door and you have less time than, than you might like. This is something that can be done over a period of time. I mean, I think right. another big barrier, we were talking a little while ago about what stops people from leaving. I think another big 
big problem a lot of people have in their minds is that they think, I need to know exactly the right thing to do before I leave. Yeah. And that could not be further than the truth. You know, it's funny you say that because there's a quote, E.L. Doctorow, I'm going to butcher it, but he essentially said, you know, life is like driving a car at night. You can only see as far as your headlights, but you know you're going to make it home, right? Yeah. And yeah. there's this idea about the unknown where I need to know exactly what job I'm going to become VP of business development in a tech company. I need to know exactly what that is before I even take the first step. Right. And the point really is, no, 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 you need to take that first step to, you need to flip it. You need to take that first step to really understand ultimately what this role is that aligns with you. Yeah, that was my experience. That's been the experience of so many people that I've talked to and written about. And a lot of life after law is stories of people's transitions. But once you, what, what more often happens, what's more realistic, is once you start taking the steps toward answering these questions, opportunities arise that you didn't know about. That's right, that's right. You know what to look for before. So every step you take leads you to things that you can't possibly anticipate from point zero. It, yeah, and, I, the, and it, it, there's a, it's, it's such a ahead. nugget what you just said right there. Yeah, yeah no, is. go ahead, go ahead. I'm, well, I'm just, no, I mean the thing is, we totally talked in alignment to, here. We've talked about this with other people, and, and even Gabe Rothman. You don't have to know exactly what you love or what you want to do in the in the long run. It's just taking that step to moving towards what you want, because all of us are on these pathways in our careers where sometimes we have three, four, five, ten different things that we end up doing. And Gabe said it so eloquently. Look, I had no clue, but I knew I just needed to start the process and move towards it. And it was, it was a revelation to him, like, I don't need to wait until the perfect thing comes along because a lot of times you won't know what that perfect thing is until That's you right. start to experience other types of careers or uh, anything outside the law. And it's just moving. It's like that the, the, the uh, thousand mile journey begins with the, the first step. That's what it right. eventually takes is just take a step towards something right. and doing the little things like you both talked about. I will also say that just taking those steps is a really good strategy for risk-averse people. Yes. Because I am a risk-averse person. That's I think probably. all three of us are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hate risk, please. So the way you make most, the way you ensure that your next career is going to be the right one is by taking it slowly and yeah. taking it step by step and figuring out and testing and thinking, you know, right, what are the building blocks of this best new career for me? Yeah. What do I really want to do? And so, and build a resume that capitalizes on what you want to emphasize. But it's the experiences that you've had already that are gratifying that are going to do two things. First, they're going to prove to you that you're a good fit for the next job that you want. And as importantly, maybe more importantly, they're going to help you persuade somebody else to give you that job. It, Just because you want to be in a new career doesn't mean that you get to automatically snap your fingers and do that unless you're going to be self-employed. So taking these steps, having yeah. this pragmatic approach yeah. makes you more hireable. That's right. That's and that's right. I think it's huge that, you know, I'll talk to people as clients or I leave law behind and there's many people I won't work with because they say, just tell me where I need to go. And my mm -hmm. answer is, we, I don't know yet. We don't know where. And the reason I say that is because I want them to avoid leaving a job in the law they don't like for a job outside the law they still don't like. Exactly. So just because, again, VP of business development at a tech company, let's say, sounds very glamorous. It may not be for you. We have to have those thoughts, like you mentioned, the line of Starbucks, unique genius analysis, and so on, to really understand what jobs out there will align. And then to your point, Liz, that's where you feel really authentic. You feel sincere. So when you get in front of a hiring manager at a non-law job, one, you are extremely confident because you've done that work about that you think this role is really good for you. And two, instead of kind of being desperately like, please take me job, it's more of you're interviewing the company as well. You want to see if this company and role is really in alignment with you because if not, don't, don't take it. Yeah, you want to reduce as many unknowns as you possibly can before you get into that interview. And having this thoughtful approach, the step-by-step -step approach, is the way to reduce those unknowns for you and for them. Because the worst thing would be to leave law for a job that, you know, that then you hate. Although, that happens, they can be fixed. That's it. Well, and the way that I've done it is, 
before you take the job, you kind of have a little bit of a BS test and you say, okay, is this really in alignment with me, this new non-law job? Not really. So then what is it? Is it 60% there, whatever it is? And then if you just feel comfortable, you say, look, this is a stepping stone out. I'm getting out. This is a segue. There's probably a better job down the road, but at least you're just being honest with yourself as to what sort of function this job, this new job is going to, going to do for you. Well, let's right. talk. Oh, go ahead. Liz. Sorry. Go ahead. And then, and hopefully in that transition job, you know what to focus on. You know right. what skills you need to build up for that next job. So you know and you're, why you're there. And, and you're meeting new people, networking in this new area. It's that Petri dish where you're doing, yeah. 